morning, everyone. <laughs> I pray you're watching this on our Sabbath morning, and uh, as you know, like so many places, so many churches, uh, we are closed this morning, but uh, we want everyone to be healthy, and I just want to share it with you as your pastor, uh, that no one wants this to be open more than me, no one wants to be with you as much as I do, and uh, it's not an easy determination to close these doors, but as I was in prayer and as I was at home, uh, it was very much upon my heart if I had any part in one of our people passing because we had met here and someone was infected, uh, it, it would be very hard for me to accept that. And, uh, in all honesty, I would probably hold on to that for the rest of my life. And uh, So, we're going to go with better safe than sorry, and we'll be back here as soon as possible, and I know this isn't the same as being together, but we're figuring out ways uh, through video chats and different ways that we can be together. Make sure you use your phone a lot, call your friends, stay in touch, and uh, we know that God is with us, and that uh, this church will continue to grow and continue to be strong as we move forward. And uh, With that being said, uh, does anyone have any announcements? <laughs> so, no one raised their hands, so we're going to go ahead and have our opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can share in praise and worship of you. We ask your blessing upon all those who watch this, that their hearts are with you, that they hear your word, that they hear your songs, uh, that they are truly touched, that the Holy Spirit is with them, and not just with them, but in them. Uh, we pray for everyone in this congregation that they be kept safe, that they make wise decisions and stay home as much as possible and stay away from the illness so they are not infected, uh, that we may return all the sooner. We pray for our, our country, our world. Uh, we know that these things happen periodically, and that they are allowed by you, and that uh, they are always a reminder of your sovereignty, of your strength, uh, that, that no one has the power that you have. And we just uh, pray your blessing upon the hearts that hear these words, and that all that we do and all that we say is pleasing in your eyes. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. So now, uh, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Send this out to Rosalie. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have our Old Testament reading. We're going to go to Psalm 63. My soul thirsts for you. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. The word of God for the children of God. Praise be to God. There is a fountain. Oh, there is. Guilty stay. 
Don't get to watch any of you fall asleep and wonder what you did last night that kept you up so late. So here we go. See how it goes. Now we're talking about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. We have that ping. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus, that's why we have all these shoes. We're over 70 shoes. If you pick up shoes, you can leave them at the church, give me a ring. Uh, we'd really like to get to 100, and uh, that would be awesome. 50 to Buchanan, 50 to Niles, that would be a great, great thing. But uh, we're talking about Jesus, talk about walking in his footsteps. And one of the things that we rarely hear, don't hear very often, is how much God loved Jesus. We know that, it's in our hearts. We know that it's true, but how often have you talked about how much God loves Jesus? We talked about how much Jesus loves us. We talked about how much God loves us. We talked about God sent Jesus, uh, but Jesus was God's son. And every time Jesus talked, he talked to God, he said, my father who art in heaven, the prayer that we pray, the thing that we talk about, uh, but today we're going to talk about our good, good Father. We're going to talk about Jesus a little bit and our relationship with God. But really, uh, do you think of God truly as your Father? And that's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to begin in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 14, which says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with the steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far from the east as it is to the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And so when you think about God, what do you think about? You think about God as the comforter. In your times of trials, you turn to God. It's a popular saying in the church uh, that you grow the most when you're hurting. You need God the most when you're hurting, and you turn away from God when things are good. It is in the Bible. It is in history. Uh, right now, we are in the midst of good times. We are very, very blessed, and yet we find ourselves turning away from God. He is our creator. All that is here, all that we have, all that we are is because of God. It is because he created everything that we see. He is our caretaker and he is the father that is always present. Some of you had dads that weren't around much and you wish they had been. But we know that you can call God anytime. There's no country song. I can call Jesus anytime. He's always on the line. And that is the truth. And anything you can take about a father, anything that was good about your father, God is. And everything that you think or thought or wish your father would have been, uh, God is those things. And so he is the perfect father and he does love us and he is always with us. And like a good father, uh, he teaches us lessons, amen? And so a good father doesn't just let you do whatever you want. Does a good father let you eat ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And for dessert, you have M&Ms, and then maybe throw in some donuts, some cake, and some pie once in a while, and maybe that's your idea of a good diet. But that wouldn't be a good father. You wouldn't be a good parent if that's what you did for your kids. Children need discipline. Human nature on its own is a rebellious nature. 
If you haven't read the Bible, I recommend you do, and what you will find in the Bible is only Jesus is perfect, and there's a few people, Elijah, Elisha, and a few others that do a pretty good job staying on the straight and narrow, but everyone else goes astray. Everyone else rebels. Everything, everyone else heads to trouble. David was a very good king, and then uh, lust took over. Solomon, the same thing. Solomon started out, was given wisdom. Uh, he started out good, was given wisdom, and then he went down the trail of a thousand wives. And we find that everywhere in the Bible. And so a good father teaches us right from wrong, teaches us to not go with what is our human nature, not to book ourselves more than him, not to think that we know better than God, uh, but he teaches us that if we will listen to him, if we will obey to uh, obey him and his word, if we will learn the Bible and learn his heart, that he will bless us. What else we learn? A good father, if he's going to discipline us, there are consequences for our actions. How many of you have gotten in a lot of trouble in your life? You go through life, you do this wrong, that wrong, and no one ever cares. So if you drive downtown and you go 120 miles an hour every time you're downtown, nobody cares, right? And the answer is no, that someone's going to catch you at some point, you're going to get a pretty hefty ticket. And there's all kinds of things. If you just walk into a store and take everything you see, I like this, I like this, and then you walk out the door with it, uh, once in a while you might get away with it. Even often you might get away with it. But at some point, you'll get caught, and there will be consequences for your actions. And it's the same way with God. That's a, it's an important thing to, to know your Bible, not just to read the parts that are ooey and gooey and make you feel good, but to read the whole Bible, because when we read God's holy word, we see that the people continue to turn away from God. In the Bible studies, we look at the book of Judges as the example of the sin cycle. And it's so important because our lives are absolutely a sin cycle, where we're close to God, we come to God, we love God, and then God blesses us, we feel good, and then we go out on our own, we stray away from God. And it leads us into sin. And then we realize our sin, or we get caught in our sin, and then we come back to God and say, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I know not what I do. But the truth is, we usually do know what we're doing. But we need God. And we need God to help keep us on the straight path. We need God to teach us. We need God to comfort us when we know we've sinned, to release us from that shame. And that's how we grow. That's how we get closer to God. Because we know that He is the good, loving Father. We're going to read a passage now from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy uh, takes us back to Moses' time. And this is Moses' prayer, so it's right at the end of his life. And depending on uh, what theory you go with, it's either around 1250 B.C. or in the early 1400 B.C.s. But anyways, uh, this is, we'll show you how human nature does not, has not, will not ever change. And these are the words of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 9. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, he who made you and established you? Remember the days of old, consider the years of the many generations as your father, and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, 
when he divided mankind, when he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. And so if you uh, rewind this just a little bit, and go back and look at Deuteronomy 32. This is a huge passage. This is very, very important because it talks about God's love for his people. God created them. God loved them. God made them wonderful and beautiful and perfect in the beginning. But then they turn away. And then they're sinful. And then they don't want God anymore. But in the end, when you read that last part of verse 9, but the Lord's portion, what does God love? What does God want? What is God's favorite creation? And it is us, it is you, it is me. We are his children. Hold on to that, love that, feel that, know that you are loved by God. Let him hold you in his arms. Uh, let those emotions flow to God. Whatever your hurt, whatever your pain, whatever your struggle, whatever you think you cannot get rid of, whatever keeps you from being closer to God, what you think uh, makes you not good enough to be close to God, Simply hand it to him. You are his favorite creation. You are God's blessing. When we look at the Old Testament, we see over and over and over and over again, we read in the midst of that, and uh, especially the evening Bible study that we're having now. Uh, sin in the Old Testament is not so much I stole my neighbor's camel or goat. Sin in the Old Testament is turning away from God. And when they turned away from God, they began to worship other things. And when we look at our society, are we worshiping God or are we worshiping football? Do we worship, come to church, or do we go to baseball games and hockey games? Do we go to the movies? Do we go to plays? Do we go to all these things and we worship these? We worship our fun. We worship our self pleasure. We worship what we want to do instead of worshiping God, instead of going to church. Uh, and you can make anything your God. I'm sure you've heard many sermons about whatever it is uh, that you like the best in this world is your God. The Bible says where you spend your money, show me where a man spends his money and I'll show you where his heart is. Do you spend your money doing godly things, like the soup, like the fruit, like the shoes, like tithing? How important is that to you? And for this world, as this world continues to turn away from God, continues to turn away from the church, uh, we have a God that absolutely created us. We have a God that absolutely loves us, but how happy is that God with us right now? As the, the churches begin and continue to close, as fewer people go to church every week, as churches begin to sell out and let society tell them what God should say and what the Bible should say, and uh, how many people do you know, how many places do you go when you're with Christians and they say, well, my God thinks this. And they say that because they know what they're saying is not in agreement with the Bible. And so our God that loves us, the God that created us, the God that we are, his child, is not always happy. How many of you used to be kids? Uh, how many of you got in trouble as a kid? How many of you were reprimanded as a kid? So your parents did not, or were not happy with what you did. They were not happy with the road you were going down. Uh, you got in trouble. And that's how a Christian's life is. That's how the life in the church is. When we're getting it right, when we're serving others, when we're reaching out to the community with love, when we're saving souls, uh, God is truly with us. God is guiding us, just like the wandering Jews. But then we go astray, then we become selfish, and uh, clearly the Bible shows us, clearly history shows us that God, when he is not happy, will allow things to happen, which takes us back, the best example, once again, to the book of Judges. So I'm going to read you one more passage as we move forward and begin to talk about this coronavirus. 
So Matthew 24, 3 through 14 says, and it talks about uh, the signs at the end, when God's not happy. When God's finally had enough, this is what's going to happen. But Jesus talks about the things that happened before that. He's talking uh, Jesus, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Amen. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For the nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, but you to death, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise, and those false prophets will lead many astray. And because the lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And so the coronavirus is what we have right now. We've had different flus in the past. Uh, you can always go back to the good, the plague, back in the medieval days, the dark ages, that killed whole towns. We have the, the flu of the 1800s that wiped out whole towns. And these things keep coming up. And uh, what happens is we get full of ourselves. We're in charge, we're in control, we can fix anything, we can make anything, we can do anything we want to. We are our own God. But God sends us reminders from time to time to let us know that we are not in charge, that we are not in control. And it's not a pleasant lesson, it's not a lesson that we want to talk about. We like the warm, fuzzy God, we like the God that tells us everything we want to hear. But that's not the whole story, that's not the truth of God, because God requires obedience. God requires that we love Him above all things, that we love each other. And as this world continues to turn away from God, it will be reminded that there is a God. And we talk about this coronavirus or any of the other flus that we've had in recent history that you can remember, any of the other diseases, and they are reminders that we need God, that we need the Father. The examples of Jesus healing in the Bible aren't even necessarily that you and me or Jesus is going to heal everybody. They are examples that God can overcome everything. And your healing might not take place on this earth. My healing might be in heaven, but in the end, for eternity, you will be healed. You will be made whole. And here on earth, something that we can't even see like this coronavirus has shut down this whole world. We can't walk outside and see a coronavirus walking down the street. We can't go down, we can't get like put off on ourselves to keep the mosquitoes away, which doesn't work for me even then, because they love me. But this little microscopic bug that's going around can devastate the world. And in all honesty, at some point, there might be something that just takes everyone out. God promises with the rainbow, the true meaning of the rainbow is that I will never like that again. But there are viruses, there are things that can take place, and we're doing all we can for people not to die. Scientists are trying to come up with some way to remedy this, and maybe they will, but I guarantee you, uh, it might even start next month, that there is another virus that will go around that could be even more devastating. And next year we can have another flu or whatever you want to call it, another disease, another bug. They can be even more devastating than this one. And there is no end. 
And we can try to fix these things. We can continue to think that, oh, I'm in charge. Oh, I know everything. Oh, I can fix this. Oh, we can turn to science. We can turn to the government. But God's message in all of these illnesses, all of these sicknesses, is not to turn to the scientists, but for we as a people, all the people, every person in the world, to turn to the Creator, to turn to God, to return to their Father, and let Him take care of us. And so as you go on this week, uh, reread these passages, let them talk to your heart, uh, take care of yourself, make wise decisions. You know, when the Satan tempted Jesus, uh, he said, do not tempt me. Jesus didn't go along with it. Jesus uh, didn't jump off the cliff as Satan wanted him to do. So make good decisions, but uh, be in prayer. And know that in these Every time we face these serious illnesses, every time we face a pandemic, every time things get this serious, that it is God reaching out to us, saying, return to me. Return to the Father who loves you. Amen. All right, now we have our closing prayer. Let's all bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. No matter where you, uh, the people watching this are, no matter what they're doing, we know that you are with them. We know that you love them. We know that they love you. Uh, we pray and, uh, and give thanks for this shroud of protection that Berry County, Cass County, remain unblemished. Uh, we give you thanks for that. Uh, we pray for those uh, with any other kind of illness that you bring healing to their bodies, emotionally, spiritually, those that are hurting, those that are growing. We know in any congregation you are there and you are calling people to change. You are calling people to grow. At this time that we have to ourselves, uh, be very much like the monks. It gives us more time to read our Bible, more time to be in prayer. Let us not waste it by being selfish, but let us turn to you. Use that time wisely to grow in relationship with you. We just pray your blessing upon your beloved children, uh, that they continue to share their hearts wherever they go, uh, to, to be on that phone, to be helpful wherever we can, and to serve for the glory and the kingdom of God. And uh, we just pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's blessed children say, Amen. All right, uh, here's a song God put on my heart. There's a longer story that goes with it, but I'll tell you guys when we're in person. And uh, uh, if you guys are in agreement, then I would like to start doing this at the close of our services. And it's kind of along the lines, very much, of the Notre Dame alma mater melody, but the words are very different and uh, very much what I think is the heart of this church. So. And Sharon's sending the words out in email, so if you didn't get that, let her know and she'll send it to you. And then you'll have them at home to sing along. And hopefully by the time we meet in person in a few weeks, that we'll all be able to sing this together and it'll be beautiful. Father God Come. Mm -hmm.